Shenandoah. Uh, near Shenandoah, coincidentally, where my company owns and operates a state-of-the-art biorefinery. He has spent more than 20 years promoting renewable fuels, including 16 years as executive director of the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Monty Shaw. Thank you, sir. So, I'd like to thank Devin for that introduction and for the dedication that he's brought to being a leader at IRFA board. I appreciate his optimistic can-do attitude and I think it's kind of emblematic of the entire IRFA board. So on behalf of our staff, we want to thank the entire board for trusting us and empowering us to work toward a better biofuels future. I also want to salute the foresight and the perseverance of the board because 20 years ago, uh, or actually next month, we will celebrate our 20th anniversary, as Devin mentioned. So tw back in 2002, they got together and formed the IRFA. So for the first time, as Devin had, we're, we're showing this new logo. It's nothing flashy, it's just a subtle reminder of how far we've come. And it has been an eventful two decades. If you didn't catch our 20th anniversary video before Devin spoke today, we're gonna play it again before the, uh, so come back about 10 minutes early, we're gonna play it again before the afternoon session. It's great to be back at the summit in person. And so I'd like to recognize and thank Lisa Caulfield, our marketing director, for making this happen. Lisa, thanks for getting us back here together. Cassie Walter is also going to be around today. She's our communications director, and she helps us get the word out about biofuels from all across Iowa to all across the world. And she even tries to teach me about social media stuff. You know, um, face chat, snapbook, and that tweetygram, whatever that is. I'm sure you guys are all on that. And finally, Nathan Honstein is out at our booth in the atrium, and he's, spending, he's going to be spending quite a bit of time down at the Capitol over the next few months to help enact Governor Reynolds' biofuels access bill, which we'll hear more about later. So I can tell you that our staff takes its responsibilities very seriously. We know that biofuels are important to each of you and to the state of Iowa. So I'm going to leave most of the numbers to the economists speaking after lunch, but let me share a few. In 2021, Iowa ethanol production rebounded to 4.4 billion gallons. That is an all-time record, just barely eclipsing 2018. And it accounts for about 29% of total U.S. production. Now, Iowa biodiesel production was also solid, but it dipped just a bit from the last year to about 340 billion gallons. Now, even with those opposite moves, the combined impact of biofuels production on the Iowa economy has never been greater. Those production numbers matter, but so do expenditures. And with the higher commodity prices in 2021, Iowa biofuels producers spent a record amount of money on feedstocks and other inputs. The results are impressive. We don't have the full report done to release today, but here's a sneak peek at the impact of biofuels production on the Iowa economy in 2021. We had GDP boosted by nearly $5.2 billion. We added $2.6 billion of household income. Much of that is farm income. And we support nearly 46,000 jobs at the plant, but mostly throughout the economy with that type of economic activity rolling around. And just think about it, 20 years ago, not a lot of that existed. So while I don't have time to recap all the highlights and milestones since 2002, I do want to spend a few minutes talking about 2021. So, last year at the summit, we were virtual, but I stated that I felt 2021 was kind of starting out optimistic. Um, you know, vaccines were rolling out, we thought maybe the end of COVID, or at least, you know, the end of the bad COVID was near. Uh, gone was the Trump EPA and all of its incessant attacks on the renewable fuel standard. In was President Biden, who had actually called the RFS his bond with our farmers. The new EPA administrator, Michael Regan, made his very first trip outside of D.C. right here to, I right here to Iowa for and toured Lincoln Way Energy. And in February, the EPA announced that it would apply a key court ruling nationwide that was going to rein in some of these unjustified renewable fuel standard exemptions. We were actually able to start traveling. We went to D.C. We were able to meet with our elected officials. We held our biofuels tour again, where we bring those same policy officials and their staff back to Iowa to tour farms and biofuels plants to learn more about what we do here. And we were able to get local officials and, and federal officials back into plants for plant tours. But as the year went on, I got to tell you, the optimism began to fade. Delta and Omicron waves of COVID hit and put the economic recovery in question. Uh, the supply chain issues drove inflation to levels not seen since the 1980s. Some of us here actually can remember that. The RFS exemption denials, they didn't come. The D.C. Circuit Court threw out year-round E15, and the Biden Build Back Better bill rolled out with billions for EVs and not a penny for renewables initially. Now, finally, 
the Biden EPA in early December released its proposal for the 2021 and 2022 RFS levels. The 2022 numbers were great. The 2021 number was a little disappointing, and then they proposed to reopen the 2020 rule that had been finalized in order to reduce those levels, and that was quite frankly dismaying. And throughout the year, if any time you listen, what came? An incessant drumbeat that electric vehicles were the only, only solution for our transportation fuel. What's that mean? Does that mean there's no future for biofuels? Now, I do want to pause here and say something important. I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to the entire Iowa delegation. Throughout this year, our Iowa representatives have stood united across party lines to back biofuels. They stood united to oppose EV mandates. They stood united to restore year-round E15. They stood united to support biofuels being added into that Build Back Better bill. And they spoke with united voice to oppose reopening the 2020 RFS rule to lower those blending levels. We cannot say thank you enough for their consistent support. Okay, let's give them a round of applause. But you know, in most of DC, that type of consistency has been hard to find. Let me go through a few things. When EPA rolled out that proposal on December 7th, Administrator Regan stated, and I quote, EPA remains committed to the growth of biofuels in America as a critical strategy to secure a clean, zero carbon energy future. Now putting aside the shortcomings in that proposed rule, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Sounds pretty good. But what else were we hearing? The very next day, December 8th, President Biden signed an executive order outlawing the federal government from purchasing vehicles that can run on biofuels starting in 2027. And that followed when he'd been in Detroit and had declared automakers, the future of the auto industry is electric. There is no turning back. I mean, talk about whiplash, right? And yet, while that's going on, and they're trying to mandate EVs here, the head of California's Air Resources Board, which oversees the state's low carbon fuel standard, was saying, and I quote, we need both EV infrastructure and renewable fuels infrastructure to support consumer uptake in the light duty space. There is no magic switch that's going to make all of our vehicles electric. It's going to be a transition, so renewable fuels will have to be a piece of the carbon reduction strategy, end quote. Why in the world is DC ignoring the lessons learned from the most aggressive and longest running low carbon program in the country? In October, the Biden climate advisor, Gina McCarthy, and, and transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg, declared, quote, the future is electric, while dismissing internal combustion engines as so yesterday. And yet, at the same time, Toyota's chief scientist was at an event advocating that government incentives should be aimed at reducing carbon emissions, not picking which car technology is the best way to achieve those goals. And he stated, quote, it is not for us to predict which solution is the best or to say only this will work. Can I get an amen? I mean, I was just, I wanted that guy to come here. He's apparently too busy. I was just going to, we'll just have him up here the whole day. We just want to compete, right? And there's also a study out of Detroit where a group went and they said, okay, let's look at the real results when you compare electric vehicle charging costs to liquid fuel, real world results. When you take a comprehensive look at all the factors, they actually concluded that EVs typically cost more to fuel than liquid fuel cars if those cars get reasonable gas mileage. So why is there this disconnect? Another disappointment came in December when the EPA finalized the revised CAFE rule. Despite a strong effort led by former Democrat state senator, excuse me, state, start over, led by former Democrat Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, the new rule failed to restore flex fuel vehicle incentives or to create a high octane, low carbon fuel pathway. In announcing the rule, Administrator Regan stated, at EPA, our priority is to protect public health, especially in overburdened communities while responding to the president's ambitious climate agenda. Today, we take a giant step forward in delivering those goals while paving the way toward an all electric, zero emissions transportation fuel. Now think about that. In two weeks, biofuels went from being a critical part of the low carbon strategy to just a speed bump on the highway to an all electric future. I mean, are we just on the wrong side of history? I don't think so, because consider in other countries like India, their government is now calling for all the automakers to produce all flex fuel vehicles. And in, in, uh, and in the soaring fuel prices this summer sent French drivers rushing to buy E85 because it was costing at that time about 0.69 euros, if I'm saying that right, per liter while the standard gasoline over there cost 1.72 euros. And E85 is actually available in about one out of every four fueling stations in, in France. In the United States, about one in 30. 
Again, why the disconnect? Hundreds of billions of dollars in the Build Back Better bill for EV subsidies, EV charging stations, and yes, even electric bicycles, apparently isn't enough because in November, Biden's Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, breathlessly stated to Congress that they couldn't wait another day to pass an urgent $52 billion in subsidies for domestic semiconductor manufacturing research because otherwise, the U.S. wasn't going to be able to meet Biden's EV goal. Can you imagine how many FFEs we could produce if we could throw $52 billion of incentives at them? It'd be, it'd be crazy. But meanwhile, while they're saying that, the International Energy Agency was warning in a report titled The Role of Critical Minerals in the Clean Energy Transitions that, and I'm going to quote this, it's pretty long, but it's important. Many minerals come from a small number of producers. For example, in the cases of lithium, cobalt, rare, and rare earth elements, the world's top three producers control well over three quarters of the global output. This high geographical concentration, the long lead times to bring new mineral production on stream, the declining resource quality in some areas, and the various environmental and social impacts all raise concerns around reliable and sustainable supplies of minerals to support the energy transition. Shouldn't that be concerning to us? I mean, how many times have you heard climate change activists say we must act in the next decade to prevent irreversible harm? Not start to act, act. We have low carbon affordable biofuels that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles on the road today. Now, admittedly, we're a little biased, but it seems like that should be a big focus, right? Something that can matter this decade. Do you feel like biofuels are a big focus in DC right now? Today, the only federal law on the books designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is the renewable fuel standard. That's a nice trivia fact, only law on the books, federal law. So what does the administration do? Do they aggressively go after that as part of their low carbon strategy? No, instead the EPA proposes to do something that it's always said it doesn't even have the lawful ability to do. They propose to reopen up a finalized RFS rule. Now think about this. The 2020 RFS proposal that's out there right now is both likely illegal, but it would also cut RFS levels below what was previously approved by Donald Trump. By Donald Trump. If you're gonna cut that, I don't know, okay? Biofuels can make a meaningful impact this decade, but all we hear from DC is the need for an all electric future to save the environment. Well, let's be honest. If you know about this issue, then the so-called electric future just isn't going to be here for more than 10 years, probably quite a little bit more, well after the deadline that the climate scientists tell us is too late to take action. And so when it comes to saving the environment, we all know that biofuels have been put under the biggest, most powerful microscope all these policymakers have when determining our carbon footprint. They look at everything and, give it, and, and say, hey, that's part of your carbon footprint. But why don't they do the same thing for EVs? I want to be clear, I am not EVs, they're coming. I am pro sound science, I am pro science, level scientific playing field. So, you know, just think about it. When is the last time you heard a policymaker in DC talking about one of these headlines? If we can go to the next slide. We got Biden's green energy agenda requires batteries, but building them is a dirty business. Growth of electric vehicles is endangering the rainforest. Turns out those rare earth metals we talked about, a lot of them are in really kind of environmentally sensitive areas. How about the, uh, how the rise of copper reveals clean energy's dark side? And one even looked at keeping old cars longer can help the environment more than buying new electric cars. It turns out cash for clunkers is a really bad idea because if you go out and buy that new EV, you save some energy over that gas guzzler, but it's not enough energy savings to actually uh, offset the energy it took to build the EV in the first place. You're better off driving the gas guzzler until it has 100, you know, several hundred thousand miles on it. Now, my favorite one is electric cars have a weight problem. You know, that one kind of hit home a little bit. Um, but, it, you know, if you think about it, the heavier the vehicles are, the more likely in a crash they are to kill someone. That's, that's just, it's not pleasant, but that's a fact. And batteries are heavy. If you look at the weight of an EV versus the weight of that same car with an internal combustion engine, that EV weighs a lot more. So it turns out, unless you're in an area where the grid is super, super clean, the, the cost of the extra lives lost because of those heavier EVs actually rivals the benefits from the avoided emissions of those EVs. Now, I apologize, I was not trying to go on a rant, okay? But I was trying to give you a taste of why the frustration level is building for those of us who support biofuels as part of the solution. It's a ready solution that's being ignored, shunted off to the side, while nothing but praise is being showered on technologies that won't be here 
uh, for several years, and maybe you know, decades before they can have a meaningful impact, and whose impact might not be quite as rosy as we've been led to believe as you see some of this research rolling out. Now, as I thought about how we feel, ignored, marginalized, underestimated, unappreciated, it misunderstood, it dawned on me, that's kind of how a teenager feels. And that made me think of the movie Inside Out. It's a Pixar film about a young girl who's just moved to a new town. In the movie, you get to see inside everyone's head where five emotions, let's see if I can get this right, fear, joy, sadness, anger, and disgust, they work together, sometimes better than other times, to navigate life. And there's a scene in that movie that really illustrates where we're going. The mom is trying to create a constructive dialogue between her husband and her daughter, Riley. The dad is preoccupied with thoughts of hockey, and joy has gone missing from young Riley's brain. Now, in this scene you're about to see, let's try to imagine it this way. Imagine that US, or USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack is the mom, and he's trying to spark a productive dialogue between the Biden administration and the biofuels industry. Oh, and let's say that the hockey game that the, the dad's thinking about, let's just say that's a metaphor for electric vehicles. And to be fair, sometimes I might be the red guy in little Riley's brain. Let's watch what happens. First day of school. She's probing us. I'm done. You pretend to be Joy. What? Okay. Um, hmm. It was fine, I guess. I don't know. Oh, very smooth. That was just like Joy. Something is definitely going on. She's never acted like this before. What should we do? We're going to find out what's happening, but we'll need support. Signal the husband. Ahem. Uh-oh, she's looking at us. Uh, what did she say? What? Oh, uh, sorry, sir. No one was listening. Is it garbage night? Uh, we left the toilet seat up. What? What is it, woman? What? <sighs> He's making that stupid face again. I could strangle him right now. Signal him again. Ah, so, Riley, how was school? Riley, oh, are you kidding me? Time. For this, we gave up that Brazilian helicopter pilot? Boo! I'll be joy. School was great, all right? Riley, is everything okay? <clears throat> Sir, she just rolled her eyes at us. What is her deal? All right, make a show of force. I don't want to have to put the foot down. No, not the foot. Riley, I do not like this new attitude. Oh, I'll show you attitude. Okay. No, 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 no. Stay happy. <laughs> what is your problem? Just leave me alone. Sir, reporting high levels of sass. Take it to DEFCON 2. You heard that, gentlemen? DEFCON 2. Listen, young lady, I don't know where this disrespectful attitude came from. You want a piece of this, Pops? Come and get it! Yeah, well, well... Here it comes. Prepare the foot. Keys to safety position. Ready to launch on your command, sir. Just shut up! Fire! That's it. Go to your room. Now. Ah! The foot is down. The foot is down. Yeah. Good job, gentlemen. That could have been a disaster. Well, that was a disaster. <laughs> I've been wanting to work that clip into one of my speeches for five years, so I, I hope you enjoyed it. But, boy, i got to tell you, it sure seems like the foot has been put down on this industry throughout 2021. So that is why, as I stand before you today, I can state clearly, that the state of the Iowa ethanol, excuse me, Iowa biofuels industry in 2022 is fed up, but fired up. We're fed up, quite frankly, with being ignored and marginalized, but we are fired up to succeed in spite of it. Despite the frustration that many of us have been feeling these days, I should mention that we can take hope from knowing that in the end, it all did work out pretty well for Riley. Now, you may have had the opportunity sometime to be around uh, Secretary Vilsack, who I kind of, without his permission, put into my little movie scheme there. And if you've ever been with him in a meeting, I'll bet that he was calm, intelligent, and thoughtful. No matter the topic, he was that adult in the room. So I think we should take heart from some advice he gave in the video that played before the summit program began. As Secretary Vilsack was congratulating IRFA on its 20 years of past accomplishments, he added, quote, I hope you'll take time to also acknowledge the bright future that's ahead for the industry. 
unquote. Now that's sound advice. We cannot focus on that frustration. We have to work for the future. So in 2022, IRFA will work with Secretary Vilsack, Governor Reynolds, our, our entire Iowa delegation, and all of our champions. First, we will encourage the EPA to move forward with its proposal to deny the outstanding RFS refinery exemption requests. Simply put, they do not meet the legal threshold for approval. Next, we will work to improve the RFS blending levels. We need to defend the 2022 proposal while urging the EPA to reconsider the cuts to 2021 and 2020 levels. In addition, we're going to strongly urge the EPA to really think through the long-term uncertainty created if they reopen that 2020 final rule. Think about it. Nothing ever again would really be final. It would cast doubt over every single new action they take going forward. As Congress struggles with the size and scope of the Build Back Better bill, we will work to ensure that whatever passes includes biofuels provisions that have strong bipartisan support, including infrastructure funding and the tax credit extensions. And we will never stop working, no matter how much some people don't want to hear it, we will never stop working to promote biofuels as a permanent part of a low carbon future. When corn and, when corn and soybean plants grow, they suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. With improved efficiencies at the farm level and at the biofuel plant level, I firmly believe that one day, maybe even within the next decade, biofuels can and will be net carbon negative. That's something an EV, even when powered only by things like wind and solar, can never do. And achieving that goal will require carbon sequestration and carbon pipelines. Those projects are an essential, they are essential to the long-term viability of biofuels. Now, I'm a guy that's still actually active a little bit in my family's farming operation, so I know how emotional some of those issues can be. So I'm going to pledge right now to work with farmers and policymakers to ensure that we can find a fair and equitable path forward. And let's be realistic. America will need biofuels. The reality is EVs simply cannot keep up with the wishful thinking of D.C. politicians. Whether it's rare earth metal supply chain constraints, computer chip shortages, an electric grid that's already overburdened in many populated areas, large population centers, lack of consumer acceptance, environmental damage to sensitive areas from, from mining, or even geopolitical considerations, while EVs are certainly coming, they are certainly not coming as fast as the more hubris politicians desire. And no amount of Soviet era five-year plans is going to change that. So, our work in 2022 will not just be in D.C. We're also fired up about opportunities in Iowa as well. I mentioned earlier that a federal court threw out the regulation around, uh, excuse me, allowing year-round E15. Well, with no timely federal solution on the horizon, governors throughout the Midwest, led by our Iowa governor, Kim Reynolds, are working toward a regional solution. The Clean Air Act allows governors to ensure, to take action to ensure the regulatory treatment for E10 and E15 is the same. By exercising this authority, governors can restore year-round E15 sales for retailers and motorists. IRFA is proud to be working with Governor Reynolds and groups in other states to push for a Midwest E15 solution. And being able to offer E15 for sale, just being able to offer it is that first step. Actually putting it in front of consumers is the ultimate goal. E15, often marketed as unleaded 88, is higher octane but lower cost. So we've seen over and over again, if you put unleaded 88 in front of Iowans, they buy it. And shortly, we're going to hear from Governor Reynolds, so I'm guessing that she's going to discuss her biofuels access bill that was introduced this week that's designed to increase consumer access to higher biofuel blends like E15 and B20. Now, I don't want to steal her thunder, but this bill is an innovative example of how states can drive biofuels demand. If enacted, the Biofuels Access Bill would cement Iowa as not just the leader of biofuels production, but the leader of biofuels policy as well. It can and should serve as a model for other states. I would also be remiss if I didn't thank Governor Reynolds for doubling down on the hugely successful renewable fuels infrastructure program in Iowa. This public-private cost share program has been enormously successful in helping retailers make upgrades to offer higher ethanol and biodiesel blends. In fact, it's been so successful it runs out of money every year. So IRFA was beyond thrilled when the governor's proposed budget for this next year doubled the funding to $10 million. At that level, we can quickly expand higher blends and we can meet the goals of the biofuels access bill. I hope each and every person in this room knows and appreciates the time, effort, and leadership that Governor Reynolds has given to promoting biofuels. In fact, let's give her an early round of applause. Uh, 
Um, okay, in closing, I see we're here. I was just, you never know the schedule, so we're ready to roll. So I'm gonna close up. I believe S Secretary Vilsack was correct. There is a bright future ahead for biofuels. It may not be easy, but it never was. In 20 years of effort, Iowa bio, IRFA and biofuels industry, we haven't reached a peak. We're not ready to slowly and gracefully decline, no way. We are ready, willing, and able to grow, to do more for farmers, for rural towns, for cleaning the air, for reducing fuel costs, for enhancing energy security, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions over the next two decades than we've done in the past. Now, the politicians in D.C., they might try to dismiss us or marginalize our importance, but that should come as no surprise. That's how it's always been, right? And we, and just like over the past two decades, we will prove them wrong. We will continue to teach them a lesson that they never quite seem to learn. It's a mistake to ever underestimate an American farmer. This year is going to be one hell of a ride, so I hope you'll join me. Thank you very much and enjoy the show.